today we're going to be talking about a couple fellows who do exactly that. <laughs> They're uh, young fellows that are uh, the new generation of mathematical physics, just coming out of college, trying to make a living, you know, in the uh, mathematical physics world. And what they do is they uh, put shows on um, YouTube. And uh, what they do is essentially um, disperse, you know, diffuse the um, catechism of mathematical physics. Okay. And I talked about one of these fellows the other day. His name is Nick Lucid. And I gave a brief, um, I gave a brief uh, bio of him. Uh, he's a Curly lookalike, talks like Curly uh, of the Three Stooges. Uh, got a master's in mathematics out of some university. He didn't clarify that. Uh, possibly in Michigan. I think he lives in Michigan. Um, he's got a YouTube channel, The Science Asylum. And that's, I think, a good title because I think he recognizes that uh, science is crazy. It's crazy only because they do everything with particles and because they do uh, the uh, reification of uh, concepts. And um, yeah, essentially he regurgitates quantum mechanics and general relativity for the masses. Okay, and so well, he he does his living there. Well, let me keep up, put him up there still. And this other fellow, uh, his name is Derek Mur uh, Muller. And he's also been around for a little while now. And what he does the same thing, he's got a channel, it's called Verizitasium. Uh, he's got a PhD in mathematics out of the University of Sydney, and his uh, thesis was designing effective multimedia for physics education. So obviously he's into convincing and persuading people, and that's what he does best. Uh, what does he persuade them of? Well, the same thing as this other fellow on the left, of quantum mechanics and general relativity primarily. Okay. And uh, yeah, he is a YouTube celebrity. He's uh, got that site, Verizitasium. And he's famous for discovering the 113th element. And I think he's going to get a Nobel Prize for that. Okay, uh, You know, there's 112 elements that they've uh, essentially, they say they discovered. When you look at the periodic table on the internet, you only find them up to 103. Um, and then uh, from 104 to 112, you got to look them up. <laughs> uh, they're not there. I guess uh, someone forgot. I don't know. Most most uh, most of these sites don't have most of the um, what is it the uh, periodic tables that you see uh, on the internet uh, don't show the, those elements. Uh, but uh, this fellow he invented the hundred or discovered the hundred thirteenth element. Here it is. Okay, verisitasium. Okay, and um, what is that? What is verisitasium? Well, it's the element of truth. That's what he discovered, the element of truth. So you can see uh, where he's going to go with this. He's going to talk about truth and fact and proof. Okay, that's uh, typical of mathematical physics. That's what he was taught. That's what he regurgitates. Okay. Okay, he got into a little squabble, I guess, with this other fella. Really, I'm creating the squabble. Uh, because one guy repeated the same thing as the other guy, and the question is, who did it first? <laughs> okay, so here you have these two gentlemen, Mr. Lucid on the left and Mr. Muller on the right. And the only difference there, they have uh, their um, uh, magnetic fields, or I'm sorry, the electric fields, the electricity pointing in different directions. Uh, what I'm trying to recommend is that people get away from using the plus and minus sign that seems to come fuse a lot of uh, people out there for magnetism and electricity. I think they should use the, uh, uh, the multiplication sign and the division sign. After all, you know, when you multiply, it's a lot faster. And when you divide, it's a lot faster than, you know, subtracting and so on. So, you know, that's a recommendation on my part. Um, you can also use uh, square root instead of negative and positive and maybe powers, something like that. Okay. Keep that in mind, you know, instead of North and South Pole, we'll call it the uh, multiplication pole, <laughs> the division pole. Okay, uh, here we have uh, these two gentlemen. They uh, vouch for special relativity today. Uh, they say that special relativity has something to do with electricity and with magnetism. 
that's what caught my attention, okay? And here they are, they essentially uh, synthesize it here, right? It says, if you pass an, uh, Mr. Muller first, if you pass an electric current through any metal, it becomes a magnet, an electromagnet. But how, this, how does this work? Well, strangely enough, it is a consequence of special relativity. I thought special relativity and general relativity, or general relativity in general had had to do with the cosmic world out there. You know, they were trying to explain all that stuff. Uh, well, special relativity could be an ex exception, but he says that magnetism and electricity have to do with relativity. Now that's really curious. <laughs> I, I'm interested. I'm, uh, it caught my attention. And uh, Mr. Lucid says you can't. Uh, understand electromagnetism without special relativity. My God, you know, I mean, they they went to the same school, same monastery. <laughs> Priest taught them the same thing. And the big issue here, as I see it, is who who said it first, you know. And I kind of vouch for Mr. Uh, Derek Muller because he did his in 2013, whereas. Uh, uh, Mr. Nick uh, Lucid, he, he came in a few years later. He did it in, what is it, uh, I think 2019. So uh, if, if we're going to compare them, I think I, I would put my bet on, uh, on the fellow on the left because he said how special relativity makes magnets work. And the other fellow says how special relativity fixed electromagnetism six years later. In fact, on September 11, 9-11, maybe he was celebrating something. Okay. So, um, well, uh, what is special relativity? Well, here you have a little quick synopsis of uh, what it is. Uh, essentially, special relativity is general relativity without gravity. Uh, you know, you never, you can never fall down in flat land, and so uh, special relativity is the world of flat land, and uh, general relativity is the world of the flat universe. <laughs> <laughs> so don't confuse them. Please don't confuse flat universe with flat land, okay? Uh, two different things. Uh, so a couple of the things that special relativity is famous for is length contraction, mass increase, and time dilation. And I'll cover the first two there. Length contraction, if you travel close to the speed of light, they claim that your ruler contracts in the direction of travel. Likewise, if you uh, travel close to the speed of light, your mass increases, okay? And um, the question is, when you come back to normal speed, like you slow down and come back to Earth, you went to, to Mars or whatever, the speed of light, and then came back, or you went to a black hole or whatever, you know, uh, then come back to Earth, well, are you, has your, your ruler grown back again? Has your, uh, the um, quantity of matter got back into your body? Did you lose quantity of matter when you traveled and then recovered it when you came back to Earth? In other words, are these real or cosmetic uh, interpretations? That's the issue. And what they do is they pull out their equations, their calculators, their slide rulers, and they say, let me, let me show you. And they calculate. Okay, so you calculate and there's a difference. Okay, that's not the question. The question, is there a real contraction? Is there a real mass increase? I mean, are we putting more pounds on, meaning more matter? Are we losing that matter when we come back to an inertial frame of reference to a uh, point where you're standing still, right? And so that's that's a question a lot of people have asked over the years. There's been a debate, and <laughs> an endless debate between whether it's real or fictitious. And let me tell you what the problem is. If it's fictitious, if it's uh, if it's um, uh, cosmetic, then nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares about special relativity. The only reason they make it care, the mathematicians make it care, make it be worth its, your while, is they say, no, it's real. It's a real contraction and the, uh, in the case of the ruler, and it's a real mass increase, meaning what? Because they never define mass, but 
if you go out there and ask anybody from high school, et cetera, they'll say, well, yeah, mass is the quantity of matter or a measure of the quantity of matter. So did we add more quantity of matter while traveling? And if you travel faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, almost at the speed of light, are you gonna bloat like a, you know, like an elephant? <laughs> So this is this is the issue with these people. You know, are we talking real or or fictitious? If it's fictitious, who cares? You know, yeah, do your calculation there and don't bother us. But now these people come into physics and say no, these uh, effects are real. And that's where we have a little bit of problem. And what uh, these two fellows are going to do, they're going to incorporate these notions, especially the uh, length contraction, uh, into physics, into the, their analysis of electricity okay and that's where i have a little bit of problems okay yeah okay so nick gets started nick uh, uh lucid he gets started first and he starts off on the wrong foot really because he's going to start with the word field okay keep that in mind so here we go with a field okay this is what mr lucid says he says um Things like magnets and charges can exert forces on each other over a distance. That kind of that kind of seems it kind of seems like magic, which is a problem. These two fields are a way for us to avoid that problem. Oh, so he's going to avoid the problem by introducing the word field. Okay, they act kind of like a middleman or intermediary. One charge creates a field, and it's that field which that actually which that actually exerts a force on the other charge. The whole purpose of those fields is to explain force at a distance. And he continues, says the Maxwell heavy side equations tell us how fields are made. Well, we got a problem right off the bat because he's going to use the word field as a physical object. Okay, He's going to say that it's the mediator, and with it he's going to explain what? Action at a distance, something that no mathematician on planet Earth has been able to explain in the last 400 years. Only with a rope model do you have actually no action at a distance, just that you can't see the mediator. But these people talk about action at a distance since they uh, don't want to put a little spirit in there, you know, a little angel or God's, you know, black magic in there. They say, well, it was done with energy or it was done with mass or it was done with a field. This fellow's going to use the field. So what is a field? Okay, let's find out. Okay, we look it up, make sure we understand what he's talking about. It says a field is a physical quantity. Bunch of numbers. That's what a field is. Represented by a number or tensor that has a value for each point in space and time. So we're talking about a bunch of values surrounding something. Could be a gravitational field, could be an electric field, magnetic field. What they're talking about is a bunch of values that they can measure that get stronger and stronger as they as you approach the center of the object that's uh, that all these bees are humming around. <laughs> okay. And I like uh, what someone put in Quora. He said, the effects of fields are observed, but nobody knows what physical process is causing the effects of fields. This is one of the many unresolved mysteries of science and is a subject of ongoing research. Now, nobody's researching fields. They, they've, ever since Faraday invented the word, they've been using the word field. They, in fact, they extended it to gravity because until then it was used for first for magnetism, then for electricity, and eventually for, um, for uh, gravity. And nobody's researching the word field. So, so if you're waiting for someone to tell you, you know, what is a field, you're going to wait uh, a billion years, at, I would think, you know, till the big crunch. Nobody's ever going to tell you what a field is because no one's researching these kinds of subjects anymore. Okay, Right now, they just use whatever they've got out there and they fly, fly with that, with, with those notions. Okay, uh, so this is uh, what people usually think of when they think of a field, the mathematicians. That's the physical notion, some three-dimensional cobweb in there that extends all the way to the edges of space-time, and then that's what they're going to be doing their magical gravity and uh, electricity and magnetism with. 
But see, when you look at that definition that you just saw, this is what you get. Okay, you get a bunch of numbers, values. Okay, I didn't put the units because I think it's irrelevant. The, the point that I want to make here is that a field is a bunch of vibrating numbers. Uh, they're they're uh, numbers that are surrounding an object. That's all it is. Center of the object's uh, more intense and farther away, less intense, whatever a field is. In other words, it's a mathematical uh, contraption. And they refer to it as sometimes as a mathematical object. No, uh, they put the word object to, to suggest to you that they're talking about physics. They're not. They're talking about math, but they want to give you a physical interpretation. So they say, well, just imagine that it's this cobweb that's out there, and then let's not worry too much about that. Let's continue with math or with the this description, because all they can do is describe. Yeah, they don't. They never identify the field. They never will. And so, personally, I don't think that uh, Mr. Lucid uh, can tell the difference between a um, wheat field and a marijuana field. Okay, because he says. A magnetic field is one reference frame, could easily be an electric field in another, or even some combination of them in a third. And he says the same thing for force. And that's what he's going to try to show in his video in which he talks about special relativity having something to do with electromagnetism. Yeah, so all these people bring these fields, whatever a field is, because we don't, all we know is that there are a bunch of numbers. But when they bring them into physics, now what are they talking about? Are they going to continue talking about a bunch of numbers? No. What they do is they try to illustrate the field for you so that you can get a glimpse of what they're talking about. And that's when they commit the crime of the century. That's when they, uh, you know, veer off into left field. Okay, both these fellows, uh, uh, Nick and um, um, Derek, they start out with this in their presentations. They start out with what I showed the other day, an electric circuit. Essentially, they say, look, you know what you have there is all these electron beads going from atom to atom from one side of the battery to the other, from one so side of the source to another. Could be, you know, an electric, uh, electrical outlet in your house. Essentially, that's it. Very simple, you know, you have all the electron beads going from atom to atom. That's been the notion of uh, mathematical physics for electricity. Uh, at least I'd say the last almost 200 years, 150 years, okay? That's the notion people have, that it's a flow of particles. That's what everybody's taught, okay? Okay, so they simplify it, and they start out doing this. They say, putting just a single line, they say, okay, so here we have the atoms, right? The blue ones uh, are the protons. Those are the positive charges. And you have all these electron beads moving from atom to atom. A flow of electron beads, that's what these people think is a, um, a, uh, a current. Okay? And what's the problem with that? Well, uh, right off the bat, we have a, a problem because we have this planetary atom, which they're using. I've got the colors in reverse on the bottom, but it's the same. And like I said the other day, uh, we, we've got a problem with that atom. They cannot imagine their atom. It's an unvisualizable, unimaginable, uh, beyond reasonable <laughs> uh, atom. You cannot imagine this atom because you cannot tell me why that bead doesn't fly away. But this is the atom they're going to use to do their electricity. Okay, and they're going to create this field, whatever that is. So, so we have a concept called a field that surround because they're going to talk about the magnetic field. So we have this concept called a magnetic field, which somehow exert, exerts forces on charges, maybe, or whatever you put near them, which is char a charged object, right? And so if, if it's going to uh, produce uh, an effect, a physical effect, a measurable effect, one that you can see, you can you know, more or less touch, you know, if, if it can do that, then it can't be a concept. You can't say, well, the field is a bunch of numbers surrounding the wire. That's where the problem, that's the first problem. The second problem is this atom again, you know, uh, it's an irrational atom, but that's the one they're going to use. And then they're going to deny it at the end of the show. You know, that at the end of the show, they're going to say, well, I was just kidding.
<laughs> okay, uh, what is your real atom? Could you show me your real atom and do your electricity with your real atom? And yeah, that's where they bomb out. That's why they never do that. They present their, uh, their uh, comical uh, atom, their Niels Bohr, uh, Ernest Rutherford atom, their planetary atom. They're going to do ionization with that. They're also going to do uh, quantum jump. They're going to do electricity with that. And then they're going to deny it at the end of the show. Yeah. Ho don't pay attention to what I just said, you know, uh, because that's not a real atom. <laughs> so uh, why did they say that to begin with? They should have said, look, this is the atom that I'm not going to use, that I'm going to use, but it, but it ain't. <laughs> that's the way they should present these things. Okay, so where do they move from there? Both Because both of them explain almost identical, okay, in an identical way. They say, well, imagine there's a cat in the case of uh, uh, Mr. Derek. And here I'll put also side by side Mr. Lucid, okay? He uses a squirrel. And they say, well, what if uh, you have this cat or this squirrel and it runs together with the electron beads? Okay, so it runs at the same speed as the electron beads, okay? So now they say, well, you're approaching close to the speed of light, you know, these are very fast speeds. And now we can introduce special relativity in this context. It says, because now we're going to use frames of reference, which uh, special relativity is famous for. Okay. And so this is one way that you can look at it. Here's another way that you can look at it. Uh, this is Mr. Um, Muller again, and side by side with uh, Mr. Lucid. And what we're going to do, we're going to hold still all the electrons, and we're going to hold still the two little animals, the cat and the squirrel. And we're going to assume that they're in their frame of reference. In other words, they're, they're on Earth, and you're the guy who's running around. Okay, So if you're on the uh, protons, on the blue ones there, well, you're going to be moving in the opposite direction. That's the way they see it from their point of view. So from our point of view, you see the electrons and the cat's and squirrels going to the right. And from their point of view, they see you going to the left, all, all the protons and you going to the left, okay? But there's an added effect here that you may have missed. So let's put it up there so that you can see it, okay? If you see those protons, you can see they're, they're spaced out. There's a certain spacing between the protons, but since they're traveling at the speed of, or close to the speed of light as they go to the left, you see there that this not only do they flattened out because remember you have length contraction to the left but you also will have distance contraction there's going to be contraction of the spacing between the the uh, protons so you're going to see it more like this okay let me lift this one a little bit so that you can see this a little better okay so it's gonna going to be like that, okay? You can compare them. You can see the, the protons are closer together, okay? And here's uh, Mr. Lucid with his squirrel also. Uh, same thing. Let's see if we can get uh, the squirrel up there as well. Lift it a little bit. Okay, you see what's happening there? Okay, so, so, so what's happening is that... Uh, well, let me lift this one here, okay? So this is what you see, okay? You see uh, that uh, while you were standing still, uh, the protons are going to the left, but the top uh, uh, diagram there shows that they're going uh, faster or, or the distance between them shrinks. And, so, and by the way, they, uh, the protons also are alleged to flatten out, you know, because supposedly anything traveling close to the speed of light uh, gets shrunk in the direction of travel, okay? Uh, one fellow says the same thing. Uh, no, they're not the same thing. If that's what you were asking, uh, if you look at the bottom, you see, uh, that the protons are closer to each other. Whereas the ones on the top, they're a little spaced out a little, a, a little further. They're almost the same, but just notice that difference there. Okay. And then, um, uh, so, so what's next? Well, what's next is this. You have now, if I can get this thing up there. Okay, um, not only do the uh, proton balls get uh, closer together, okay, because that's the way the cat sees it, but the electron balls, which were before they were moving, like up there, you can see, uh, oh, uh, well, no, I had it in the previous 
thing, but the electron balls were moving. The cat was moving with the electron balls. Now the electron beads, those red ones, they are also spaced out more because they're not being flattened out closer to each other like when they were when uh, they were traveling at close to the speed of light. Okay, so let's see if we can show you that comparison. Um, here it is. See the one, this one moves uh, with a cat, and so the electron beads have a certain distance between them. But here you can see that the electron beads are farther apart. Okay. And of course, uh, same thing uh, for Mr. Lucid. Okay, so let me get this one up there so that you can see each one with his own animal there. So we have a couple of effects. We have uh, the electron beads are really the ones that are moving together with a cat and with a squirrel. They're moving to the right. However, because uh, we're gonna look at their frame of reference, the frame of reference of the cat and the squirrel, they see the protons going in the opposite direction. They see them going close to the speed of light. That means that according to special relativity, the uh, distance between the electron, uh, the proton balls uh, shortens. And, um, and on top of that, you have a double whammy because the electron beads, which were uh, shrunk in the direction of travel, in other words, the, the distance between them was shrunk, is now normal as far as the cat is concerned, okay? So from his frame of reference, um, you know, it's a little wider than what it would be for you, okay? So that's what they wanted to show there. Okay, so we get the picture. That's the general picture, okay? And here's a summary of that, in case you uh, missed it, okay? Okay, and let me put something up there before I explain that, which is gonna be the summary, okay? So these go together. And so what does Mr. Lucid say? Well, he says, how does special relativity fix electromagnetism? Yeah, good question. What does it have to do with it? By allowing measurements to change between points of view. So uh, are we talking about physics here? Or are we talking about what the observer thinks he saw? Okay, so this is uh, another issue that is always introduced uh, into mathematics. And that's why general relativity is called relativity, because the relativity part has to do with observers' opinions, eventually. That's, that's ultimately what they're, they're saying. And Mr. Lucid continues, he says, in the lab frame, he, he had um, the lab frame and the clone frame. The lab frame was essentially when the um, uh, squirrel moved with the uh, electrons, okay? And the clone frame is when the... Uh, uh, essentially, the um, uh, what is it? The um, uh, squirrel stood still together with uh, the electrons because they were in their own frame of reference. Okay, so he says in the lab frame, the moving electrons use a magnetic field to exert a magnetic force on the squirrel, and that's the image on the bottom left on the uh, on the on, on the picture on the right. Okay. In the clone frame, the electrons expanded and the positive bits contracted, okay? This left the wire charged, allowing it to exert an electric force instead. The squirrel is repelled by the wire in both frames. Magnetism is just electricity in a different frame of reference. So what is he saying? He's saying that they switched around. In other words, he says that what is magnetism to you, who is observing the... Um, squirrel move by is to him is electricity and uh, uh, to, uh, to you it's magnetism that's what pushed the squirrel of, of farther away from you for the squirrel it's electricity that pushed him out why because he says or this is their theory that all these positive charges those protons come together and there's a uh, more positive charges uh in that region and because there are positive charges, it pushes a positive charge as this uh, little um, squirrel away, okay? And in the case of the cat, who's also positive, okay, Mr. Derrick says more or less the same thing. He says, there it is. He says, 
in that in the cat's frame of reference it is repelled fr from the wire due to the electric field created by the excess positive charges produced by the effects of length contraction okay in my frame of reference the cat is repel repelled from a neutral wire due to the magnetic field generated by the current flowing in the wire so whether you see it as an electric field or a magnetic field just depends on your frame of reference so an, electric, an electromagnet is an everyday example of special relativity in action. What are these folks saying? Well, they're saying that if, uh, if you're looking at, if you had the eyes of God, you could see electricity right here flowing through you, okay? that flowing through in front of your eyes. Um, assuming they, they go to the left, okay, uh, to your... Yeah, to your left. Okay, it's the same. Uh, let's let's go to the left. The electrons are flowing to the left. Okay, and uh, so what you're seeing is, or the reason you see that a uh, squirrel in this case, or a cat, positively charged squirrel, positively charged cat, or positively charged whatever, the reason it's being pushed away is because there's a magnetic field, okay, spiraling around the wire. What is a magnetic field? Well, it's, it's that thing that they don't know. It's just a bunch of numbers. Okay, great. So that's what's pushing the cat and the squirrel away. Right. But under special relativity, you got to put yourself in the, uh, in the position of the cat and the squirrel. And you got to look at it from their point of view. Like if they're standing still and what's moving is you together with the protons. <laughs> okay. So you're moving to the right together with the protons, and because you're moving to the right, and the protons are coming together because they're moving at close to the speed of light, that means that the distance between them shrinks, aside from the fact that the proton itself flattens out, then what you have is more protons per unit uh, length, okay? And if you have more protons, protons are positive, and somehow the proton field electric field whatever that is what was a field we don't know just a bunch of numbers that pushes that's what pushes the uh the little kitty and the uh, uh squirrel away okay so that's how special relativity somehow now is part of electricity i guess all the electrician will now have to learn special relativity in order to understand a circuit okay yeah it's uh quite crazy and uh, so all we can do is provide the alternative. And uh, here it is. I explained a little bit the other day here. I'll just rub it in once more, okay? We start with an iron atom. We're gonna assume that the wire is made of atoms, uh, iron atoms, and it looks somewhat like that, but it's complex. But uh, all those are, uh, those are actual balloons. They're not uh, orbitals as quantum mechanics has it. They're actual physical balloons, okay? And so we're gonna look at the outer part of that balloon. You can see that it's uh, divided into uh, six little things that are sticking out. Those are, uh, again, balloons. Those are membranes, okay? Weaved by the electromagnetic threads that uh, form the rope, okay? All the ropes in the universe converge upon our atom. They split out and they start weaving this little atom, okay? And um, so now we're going to take a bunch of these uh, uh, iron atoms and we're going to put them together, okay? Because they merge the, uh, electro the threads, uh, electron shells as we call them, are balloons and they merge, okay? They merge and that's a long story. Uh, we do have an explanation for that, but it's beyond the scope of today. And so what happens? They merge, they form what you see on the top. Uh, they form a, uh, these molecules, essentially. You know, these long strings of atoms which are merged, we call them serpentines, okay? And what you see on the bottom, you see that the serpentine is gonna spin, okay? It's gonna spin in situ, okay? So now if we put this on our uh, circuit, okay? You're going to see something like this, okay? As soon as you um, close the switch, okay, you're going to see this snake uh, contorting all around, okay? And it goes in both directions, okay? It goes, uh, what, if we're going to use the negative and positive, 
or the multiplication and division signs, whichever one you want to use, north and south pole, whatever. Uh, it goes through both poles simultaneously okay, on, under the rope model. So we don't have to wait for the little bead to make it all the way around. No, it, instantly the, this acts like a little snake that has its head uh, touching its uh, tail. It's wound around in a circle or a square or whatever. And it twirls on itself. Okay, so that's the notion of electricity we have under the rope model. And yeah, as soon as you close the switch, you can see that everywhere it's simultaneously twisting around. Okay, so there is no delay uh, between one pole and the other. Okay. And what this allows us to explain is that there's a difference between a magnetic field and a, um, an electric field because they are two different mechanisms totally different mechanisms and this is where these people have it so wrong everybody who uses these uh, these little um, particles and trying to do everything with uh, the planetary model of the atom and this is what it looks like more or less Again, yeah, I showed it this the, the other day but it's essentially um, when when the um, uh, uh, the atom spin the uh, uh, what is it the iron um, serpentines they're all connected you know they're spin in situ when they do that they release threads those threads are the ones that swing around and those swinging threads is what we call a magnetic field that's why it exerts a force because there's something physical in there that physical uh, thing is the uh, the threads hundreds of th billions of threads and uh or like mr faraday said you know uh he said in that region it's uh, uh we have um there, there's a physicality to those threads okay you have or or maxwell also said he said what you see there is matter in motion he was talking about obviously a an exotic type of matter that he couldn't even imagine right fathom and uh yeah uh under the rope model, we proposed that what they were seeing all this, all these years were all these threads that were spinning around.